Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from Galatians chapter five. This is also our sermon text for this morning. Galatians chapter five is where we'll be today. Galatians chapter 5, we'll be reading verses 1 through 15. This is the word of the Lord. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. You are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. May the Lord bless the preaching and reading and hearing of his word this morning. Well, it is no uh, secret that today, of course, is July 4th. Uh, It is a wonderful day. I see some of you wearing your flag shirts and pins. Uh, We we could run Ron Taylor up a flagpole uh, today, and uh, I think it would be be appropriate. Um, It's a wonderful day. I'm sure the weather is nice. Some of you will grill out hamburgers and hot dogs. And it is a wonderful day each year to blow stuff up. Uh, You know, I've lived in Virginia now for 22 years. That's my only complaint is that Virginia has the worst fireworks laws of any. Okay, I'm from Alabama. July 4th is known as the nine finger holiday for a reason. Okay, so it's part of the fun is just blowing stuff up. But if I ever run for governor, that's my platform. Let's blow stuff up. But uh, Either way, it is a wonderful day and uh, a great day that is all about freedom. And uh, I cannot think of a better way to exercise our freedom as Americans than to celebrate our freedom as Christians. And that's what we're going to see today in the book of Galatians chapter 5. So if you haven't already, open your Bibles there. Galatians chapter 5, we'll be looking at these verses as we consider what it means to be free in Christ. By the way, before I uh, begin, just a, a, a note here, as I mentioned in the bulletin, the sermon schedule's updated there. I know right now there's some high-profile discussions about preaching and plagiarism. So, so let me just say, for the next few Sundays, I am plagiarizing myself. M- meaning, I'm dusting off some old sermons uh, for, for the next couple of weeks, because I'm getting ready for our next couple of series on marriage and then our study on the book of Daniel. So you can be praying about that and looking towards that. So if you think to yourself, I've heard this somewhere before. Don't start a blog and try to get me in trouble. You heard it from me, okay? This is my sermon that I'm preaching uh, and and, and dusting up for our time. So Galatians chapter 5 is where we are. I'd like to read verse 1 just to set the tone again as we study this text together. So follow along Galatians chapter 5. Verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. 
David Potchin was a 53-year-old man from Gary, Indiana. Mr. Potchin was also an ex-convict. Like many criminals, he'd spent many nights laying on a cot behind bars dreaming about what he would do when he got out of prison. Well, eventually the day came, and he made his way and took what little money he had and found a cheap motel, and he started making copies of the only resume that he had. And David Potchin started pounding the pavement and knocking on doors and just trying whatever he could to get hired, going to every business within walking distance. Well, after several days and weeks, he discovered that people didn't want to hire an an ex-con. And David Potchin found himself running out of money and running out of hope. And he didn't know what else to do. So he took his last resume that he had, and on the back of it, he wrote a note. And then he took that note, and he walked across the street to the local bank, and he slid it across the counter. The note said, this is a stick-up. Give me all your money. The woman gave him the $1,600 that she had there in her till, and then David Potchin did the most unexpected thing. Instead of running through the woods or hopping in a car to make a getaway, David Potchin walked out in the parking lot and sat down and waited for the police to come arrest him. How sad is that story? Here a man has, has finally paid his time. He lived so long behind bars that when he got out, he didn't know how to live in freedom. Even though he was was now out of prison, he voluntarily went back into it. David Potchin's story is a very tragic one. And yet his story is a great picture of what was happening to the churches of Galatia. The, 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 the churches in Galatia, they had, had received the gospel from the Apostle Paul. He had come to them on one of his earlier missionary journeys, and he preached to them the message of Christ. And these Gentiles received Christ. And as a result, they, these Gentiles found that Christ, he freed them. He freed them from their sins, and freed them from their paganism and freed them from their idolatry, and freed them from their their, their past, freed them from the coming judgment that Christ had granted all of this to them. And now some time had passed, a few decades had passed, and some of them had lost sight of that gospel that they had received, and now they were tempted to voluntarily go back behind bars. And the Apostle Paul writes this whole letter, the book of Galatians, to remind these Christians and to remind even us this morning that the same gospel that liberates us is the same gospel that rehabilitates us. See, every one of us in this room know that the gospel is free. But what we sometimes forget is that this gospel is freeing. That it transforms and and changes our perspective and our outlook. And like David Potchin, sometimes even though we have been free in Christ, what do we do in our day-to-day Christian life? We willingly offer up our wrists to be handcuffed. We're handcuffed by our guilt. Handcuffed by, by rules handcuffed by other people's opinions of us, handcuffed by certain traditions or cultural values or or handcuffed by our own sense of performance and our own need to meet certain expectations. And my friends, God's message to us this morning and the reminder is what you see at the end of verse 1 when the Apostle Paul says, do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back to it, Paul says. You've been there. You've done that. 
Now stand firm, he says. Plant your feet firmly in the freedom that you have in Christ. Church family, the, the, the great news that I have for you this morning on July 4th is this. J-E-S-U-S spells freedom. That's what he says. It is for freedom that Christ set you free. So stand in it. Live in it. Act like it. Live like it. Be the free men and women in Jesus that he's called us to be. But let's be honest. It is very tempting sometimes to offer up our risks. To, to see what other people think, to, to put pressures on ourselves, and to be shackled, to be handcuffed by our own laws and regulations. In the text before us, Paul is going to highlight three lies which handcuff us. Three lies that shackle us, and yet it's these three lies that the gospel has freed us from, it has liberated us us from. Let's look at each of these lies together. First of all, Paul tells us in verses 1 through 6 that in Christ we are free from the lie of salvation by works. We are free from the lie of salvation by works. Notice, if you will, in your Bibles, in these first opening verses here, Paul is going to explain that this lie of salvation by works is dangerous. It's exceedingly dangerous. And Paul says, don't be shackled by it. Look, look at what he says beginning in verse 2. He says, Behold, I, Paul, say to you. Now, let's just pause there real quick. Little, little Bible study tip here, all right? Whenever a, a, an author in Scripture invokes their own name, they're about to throw down, all right? Things are about to get serious. Right? In the middle of a letter, if he says, I, John, I, Paul, I, James, they're saying, I, as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Understand that what I'm saying to you is apostolic authority, and this is one of those cases. I, Paul, say to you, what? That if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Paul begins very clearly with this idea that this salvation by works uh, approach is a lie. Now, there's a play on words in the text here. It, it kind of sprinkled throughout, so I'm going to start and then we'll pick it up as we make our way through this text. It's, it's obvious, you can tell in English, the word circumcision it, it comes from the same root as the word circumference. What's circumference? It's it's the, the distance around a circle. Circumcision means literally to cut around. That's the idea. You say, to cut around what? Ask your parents, all right? They can explain that to you afterwards, all right? But just, just keep that in mind. To cut around is, is the play on words. Now, notice what he says in verse 2. If you receive this cutting around, if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Now, that sounds kind of odd. I mean, it almost sounds like Paul is saying that only uncircumcised men will go to heaven. What, what does that verse mean? Listen, this is why it's really important to read your Bibles in context. All right? You, pulling one verse out, man, that's some of the most dangerous things we can do. Read it in, in what's happening around it. The best way to define Scripture is we define Scripture with Scripture. So let me show you what he's doing here. Verse 2, he says, If you receive circumcision, then look at verse 3, Every man who receives circumcision, same thing, but then look at verse 4. You've been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. So he clearly defines what he means. He's not addressing circumcision here medically, he's addressing it theologically. He's not saying if you've received circumcision as a clinical procedure. No, no, he's saying if you have received it as your doctrinal position, that's the thing you're standing in before God. That's what you're taking your confidence in. That's what your hope is in. He says, then understand what that means. In Acts 15, there was a group of preachers that started harassing and infecting the, the churches, the early churches, and they became known as the Judaizers. You may have heard that word before. 
And the, the message of these Judaizers was actually pretty simple, but, but very, it was very um, uh, 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 deceptive. They said, you Gentiles, watch this, you Gentiles can become Christians if you first become Jews. That, that's the pathway, they said. You Gentiles can become Christians, but you first got to become Jews. You got to keep certain laws, and one of those main laws was that you had to keep circumcision. The only problem with that is everything. Jesus did not say, come unto Moses, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. He said, come unto me. We, we don't get to Christ by coming, we don't have to go through Moses. And so Paul is saying here, understand that this message, that this Jesus plus message that the Judaizers are preaching, it's not true. It's a false message. And every single Jesus plus gospel is just that. My friends, I don't care what's on the other side of that plus, it's a lie. If the preacher says you need Jesus plus baptism to be saved, he's lying to you. You need Jesus plus good works to be saved. He's lying to you. He says here, this kind of being justified by your own works by keeping the law, he says it ultimately takes everything that is in Christ and it chucks it. It's a false message. And this message of circumcision was a message of salvation by works. Now watch, this lie will not only confuse you, but it will also condemn you. Look at what Paul says here back in verse 2. If you do this, if you receive circumcision, in other words, as keeping the law to be justified, what? Christ will be of no benefit to you. I try to think about how, 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 what is he saying here, how to explain this. The best way I can think, of, imagine somebody wrote you a check for $10 million. Right? Incredible, right? Unbelievably valuable. But imagine if you took that check, that $10 million check, and you took out a pen, and on top of it you wrote, canceled. Guess what? It's worthless. It's not going to, you can't cash that. Because you've added to it, it cancels it out. Paul says, if you take the riches of Christ, and you write circumcision on top of that, you've just canceled it out. It doesn't benefit you at all. If you add to it, it completely destroys it. Salvation has not come through our works. You can't cash in on the gospel if you try to add to the gospel. So he's of no benefit to you. Verse 3, I testify again, every man who receives circumcision, he is under obligation to keep the whole law. So Paul says, look, if you want to go down this path, if you, you, if you think that just keeping the law, just understand what that means. If you're going to start climbing this ladder, buddy, you've got to climb the whole thing. If you start up that staircase, you've got to get the, the entire staircase by yourself. He, he says here, I understand that what this means is that on Judgment Day, you are going to have to present to God a record of absolute perfect compliance to every jot and tittle in God's Word. You've got to obey it all, he says. You're under obligation if that's how you're going to seek to be justified. It's a crushing requirement that no man, no mere woman, no mere man can keep on their own. And then he says in verse 4, you have been severed from Christ you who are seeking to be justified by law, in other words, to be circumcised, you have fallen from grace. Now, these Galatians, I don't think they have yet done this, and so Paul is, he really, the language of this, he's kind of threatening them as an apostle. And he basically says to them, listen, if you accept salvation by works through circumcision, then you've abandoned salvation by grace through faith. You can't have both. It's one or the other, he says. And you've got to choose between the two. So you can have Christ, you can have circumcision. You can have faith in him, or you can have faith in your works. But if you abandon Christ, then he is of no benefit to you. If you subsidize the work of Christ, you neutralize the work of Christ. 
That's Paul's point in these verses. Add to it, you've just subtracted everything. You've destroyed it completely. The message of salvation by works is a lie, and it's a lie and a message that changes everything. We, we would have to rewrite our, our old hymns. Think about it. I don't know about you, but I don't really want to come to church and sing, Jesus paid two-thirds, right? I certainly don't want to be caught singing, Amazing Circumcision. Oh, I do not want to be to sing in that. But those are the kind of hymns we'd have to sing if that's the kind of gospel we believe. But instead, we get to sing glorious words like what? In Christ alone, my hope is found. What, what did we sing this morning? Christ alone. Christ alone. That is the Christian's motto. That is the Christian's declaration of independence. It's that Christ himself has set us free from the law and the works that, that we might do. And so he says in verse 5, For we through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. But what? Faith working through love. But Paul is quite clear. How are we saved? We are not saved uh, by works through circumcision. We're saved by grace through faith. Through faith in Christ. Through trust and reliance in Him. There is a sense, some have said, we are saved by works, just not our own. It's, it's Christ's work. It's His death. It's His burial. It's His resurrection. It's His atonement that we look to. It's not the shedding of our blood. It's the shedding of His blood that is the means of our salvation. Do you remember that scene in Pilgrim's Progress when uh, Christian is making his way to the celestial city? If you've never read Pilgrim's Progress, please do it before you die. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. But uh, Christian's going along, and he, he sees the celestial city off in the distance, and he sees what he thinks is a shortcut. And he sees this little mound and thinks, wow, that's, man, that's easy. I'll just hop over that little mound, and I'll be there. And he walks over that, and as he gets closer, the mound turns into a hill, and the hill, as he gets closer, turns into a mountain. And by the time he gets to the bottom of it, he's looking at what's like a sheer cliff. And it's way bigger than he thought. And he tries to start climbing it, but keeps slipping down and says it was like the whole thing was going to collapse. It was so steep on him. And Evangelist shows up and says, what are you trying to do? Don't you know that nobody can climb Mount Sinai to get to the celestial city? My friends, that's what Paul is saying. We don't get there through, through our works, through what we have done. We need to be very careful that we not believe or teach the message of salvation by works, it is a lie that constrains us. Can I just say a word, parents? We need to be very careful in how we teach our children, grandparents, our grandchildren. We need to figure out how to teach our kids morality without teaching them moralism. Pagans don't go to heaven, but guess what? Pharisees don't either. And we need to make sure that we speak to them and we are clear of what it means to trust and believe in Christ. And as brothers and sisters, we need to be encouraged in this. I don't know about you, but in my own life, I have found myself struggling with my own sense of, of effort and performance in, 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 in confusing sanctification and justification and working through those things. I've, I've heard it said before, one of the biggest enemies to the gospel that we experience is the word enough. When we go to bed thinking, did I, did I pray enough? Did I do enough? Did I give enough? Did I read enough? In other words, our hope is, did I do enough to, 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 to be approved by God or to maintain that approval? My friend, our salvation begins in Christ and ends in Christ and everything in between is Christ. And the, the message of salvation by works is a lie. What, what does the old hymn say? Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Would my tears forever flow? Uh, I forgot it. All for sin could not atone. What's the last line? Thou must save. 
and thou alone. That's the message. And in Christ, we are free from this need to perform and to keep a set of external rules so as to maintain approval with God. Your approval before God is found through faith in Jesus. Trust Him. And my friend, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, that is the call of the gospel. It, it, is, it is a call to, to freedom. You say, I, I have tried to turn so many leaves over, it's like a, a blower in my yard. Just, I'm, I'm, it's like fall every year, I'm blowing leaves over. I can't ever seem to get it. My friends, you don't need to turn over a new leaf. You need to put your faith and your hope in the empty tomb. Knowing that Christ has done for you. He's actually kept the law where you can't. And he died the death that you deserve. And he rose again to grant salvation to those that would trust in him. If you think that church attendance is the thing that's going to keep you right before God, you are wrong. It's a lie. It's Christ and Christ alone. And we are free from the lie of salvation by works. Number two, there's another lie that we need to remember. He frees us from verses 7 to 12. Number two, in Christ, we are free from the lie that false teachers are trivial. We're free from the lie that false teachers are trivial. Paul's talked about the harmful message. Now he's going to talk about some harmful messengers. Look at verse 7. You were running well. Who, look at that word, hindered you from obeying the truth? So Paul's been talking about a what, this, this message of circumcision, salvation by work. But he says, but the real question is, who's responsible for this? Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. The, the Apostle Paul here is going to come at this several different ways. There's a little proverb in here. There's a threat. There's a bit of apostolic sarcasm. He's really trying to make the point that these guys that are telling you this, they're not your friends. They're not out to, to help you. He says in verse 7, you were running well. These Galatians started out correctly. I don't know if you've seen any of the Olympic trials that's been happening. I've caught a couple of bit. You know, those, especially those, those fast races, 100 meters, 200, whatever it is, right? What, Matt, what, they're, 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 they run a good, clean start. They get off the blocks. Wait for the gun, clean start. That's what Paul says. You're running well. You got off to a clean start. Paul was there when he preached the gospel to the Galatians, and what happened? They came with pure hearts and pure motives, and they came to the pure gospel. And he says, I saw the way that you started. He says, what I'm concerned is what? He says that someone has now hindered you. Now, remember I said there's a play on words. This is the next part of that. Uh, he, said, he, he says this word, that who's hindered you, it literally means who cut in line on you. So you were running the race, and somebody cut in. So you put it together, Paul says, these guys cut in and told you you have to get cut around. All right? So Paul's saying, wait a minute, don't, don't put this together. They've done something that they've hindered you. They're misleading you. Don't listen to these false teachers. But by the way, just can we step back for a moment? I think this, this little section here is a great reminder. Look at Paul's example here. Not only should you and I care about our own salvation and our own soul, but we should care about the souls of others. Do you see that? See, sometimes the temptation is to say, well, I'm, I'm doing right before God and see people drifting, to see people wandering, and we go, well, that's their problem. That's not what Paul does. Paul's burdened for them. Paul goes after them. Paul picks up the phone and calls them and says, hey, where, where have you been? I, I knew you were running well. You started well, but you, you're clearly not there now. He points out the error of their ways to them. And he says, I don't know who's responsible for this, but verse 8, I know who's not responsible. This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. Notice he uses that word persuasion. Rarely do false teachers introduce themselves that way you know they don't they don't show up with a name tag that says reverend harry tick you know on it that's not that's not what they that's not what they do they they're likable they're they're sometimes funny educated they got a big following good good million dollar smile P people people flock to them and he says they are persuasive 
If you're ever curious, go read 2 Peter and Jude. They talk about just how smooth these guys can be with their words and flatter you and to deceive you. And he says, you need to be careful. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes this comes in the church. This persuasion comes in the church, but sometimes it comes near the church. I I was just thinking about this week. If you go, just go to Barnes & Noble. Think about it. Many of the books at Barnes & Noble that are labeled self-help might should be labeled false gospel. Because the books sound like, and boy, they look persuasive, right? I mean, look at the people on the cover. They're happy and they're jumping off cliffs. You know, I mean, they look like they look like they figured out life. And the books have fireworks and cups of coffee. And it's like, oh, there's something there. But you open up and the table of contents is here's 12 rules for a, for a good life. Just keep these rules. Friends, that's not Christ. I'm not saying we don't need rules, don't misunderstand me, but if they're saying that is the secret to life and that is the way in which we live right before God, it's not right. They're persuading you away. He says, this doesn't come from him who calls you. Then verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. This is one of Paul's favorite word pictures. He uses this a lot in his writings. He says, these false teachers, they're like yeast or leaven. If we don't pluck them out if we don't get rid of them they will grow and infect everything that's what yeast does it it grows and infects everything around it he says these false teachers if you don't remove them they will spread like cancer so be very very careful notice verse 10 i have confidence in you in the lord that you will adopt no other view now there's some optimism here There's a little bit of Paul saying, listen, I I know the power of God's grace, and I know that some of you are, notice, in the Lord, and that you won't stray. He doesn't want any of them to stray, but he says, I I have some hope, and and I, I have confidence in this, but I'm trying to show you how serious this is. And then he says, but the one who is disturbing you, verse 10, that uh the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment whoever he is. So so Paul says these false teachers that are persuading you, they've cut in, they've tried to, to he says, do you not understand where they're headed? They're not headed to heaven. They're not headed in the right path. They're headed to doom. They may look acceptable now, they may look popular now, but they're leading you astray, he says. And they're going towards the judgment of God. Verse 11, But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? In other words, Paul says, there was a time when he preached this before he came to Christ. Remember, Paul was a Pharisee. And some people were quoting his old books, it seems, and saying, oh, see what Paul said? Paul says, that's not, I used to say that, but I don't anymore. Let's be clear what I'm saying now. I'm I'm saying to you, uh, what I'm preaching now is the cross And that's the stumbling block. The message that I'm preaching is offensive because it's not that message that's sort of culturally accepted among the Jews. He says, instead, he says, it's a message that they find offensive, and that's why I'm getting getting stoned. That's why they're running me out of town. It's because they know I'm not preaching circumcision. I'm now preaching Christ. And then we have verse 12. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves this is that play on words this is where it ends some of your translations say emasculate themselves paul literally uses this idea of cutting again paul says these guys these false teachers who cut in and told you to cut around they need to be cut off literally they need to cut themselves off is what he said this is not a little just circumcision snip snip He says, if these guys are going to go that path, they're doing it to their own destruction. And he says, I wish that they would no longer hinder you, that they would no longer trouble you, but they would put themselves out of commission, he says. Because otherwise they are leading you astray. Now again, that may be a bit of apostolic sarcasm. I I can't say for sure. But I think if nothing else, it underscores how serious this is. 
But we live in a world today where it's, well, you know, I know what he says isn't maybe what you believe, but it's not that big a deal. It's, it's not that harmful. Come on, this book is a bestseller. It's got to be. It's got to be good. Oh, man, this podcast has 14 bajillion followers. It's got to be. It's got to be worth it. Paul says, those that are preaching a false gospel, he says, it's not trivial. The New Testament has dozens and dozens of verses about what to do with false teachers. You will find every verb from confront them, correct them, rebuke them, reject them, refuse them, and avoid them, but it never says tolerate them. It never says support them. If anything, it says steer clear of them. Acts 20 says, savage wolves will come in among you. Notice that's where savage wolves often come. Not, th these aren't cute little puppies. These are savage wolves. We must be on our guard. What does this mean for us? Well, as a church, we, we must make sure that we pray for those among us who are our teachers, our elders, our staff, our, our Sunday school teachers, at some point our small group leaders, to pray that those who teach would do so faithfully, putting the gospel where it should be. But it's also a reason that we should all pray for our seminaries and pray for our Bible colleges. And I know some of you, you you've grown up around here for years and I, I, some may say, well, you know, I don't really care about Liberty University. You know, it's no big deal. I have no connection to them. You better care about Liberty University. We all better care. Because those that are sitting in the classrooms today at Regent and Averett and Liberty and Southeastern and Southern will be standing in the pulpits tomorrow, pastoring our children and grandchildren. And we need to pray that they, they, are, they don't come out false teachers that they are committed to the true gospel. Paul says, be, be very, very careful. Now, these Judaizers, let's be reminded, they're not just a different denomination. They are a completely different religion. So just because somebody disagrees with you doesn't mean that they're a false teacher. But there are those who truly are, and Paul says, it's a lie to think that they're harmless. We're free from that. Third and finally, Paul tells us in the last few verses here, that in Christ we are also free from the lie which says me before we. We're free from the lie which says me before we. Notice verse 13, for you were called to freedom. He's repeating the main idea from verse 1. Christ has set you free. Notice he says, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Now he's not talking about the skin. He's talking about the old man the unsanctified part of you that every Christian has that we feel, you know, I, I, I've got a, I, 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 it kicks against this idea that Jesus is Lord, that part of you that feels the weight of temptation. He says here, your flesh, if given the opportunity, will abuse this freedom. In fact, the word opportunity here, John Stott points out that it's often used of a military base of operations or a launching pad. In other words, he, he's saying here that if you, if you allow it, your freedom in Christ can become the launching pad for the flesh. That if you're not careful, if you go too far with this, you can start to think to yourself, oh yeah, the preacher said I'm free in Christ, I'm free in Jesus, so that means God will forgive me anyways. I can do whatever I want. And we go from one ditch to the other ditch. And Paul says, now hold on and understand where this all comes to. He says, Romans chapter 6 says what? Should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? No. Christian freedom is not freedom to sin. It's freedom from sin. And so Paul says, don't use your actual freedom to pursue this false freedom that your nature so badly wants. Your flesh wants to hijack this freedom that says, well, I don't have to keep rules, so I'm just going to go blow it out and do whatever I want. Think about it. Again, today is Independence Day. For many Americans, they think that real freedom means doing whatever I want, whenever I want. In other words, it's all about me and my wants and my feelings and my desires. But my friends, doing everything that your heart desires 
is another form of slavery. You're enslaved to your lusts. You're enslaved to your flesh. And Paul says that's not real freedom. Don't you see that you're enslaved to your wants? And so when we live by the motto that says, me first, I'm going to get what I want, he says you've misunderstood what Christ has done. Instead, verse 13, we are to, through love, serve one another. He says the good news is you are free. You know what? You're free to be a slave to God. That's it. You're free to be a slave of God and a slave of one another. And he says that we are to do this in such a way that we love each other. My friends, let's be very careful. It is very repackaged and and, and beautifully and manipulatively advertised to us nowadays that true freedom just means be true to yourself, believe in yourself, fulfill yourself. But my friends, that is me before we. And that's a lie. The gospel sets us free from that. In fact, he says it's a mutual thing, that we love one another. It doesn't work if this half of the congregation loves this half of the congregation, and this half of the congregation loves this half of the congregation, right? It's got to be back and forth. It's got to be mutual, he says. So we're all thinking, not about me, we're all thinking about we. What can we do How can I use my freedom in Christ for the good of others? Verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You say, wait a minute, preacher. You just went out of your way to say that we don't have to keep the law. Why is Paul, now in verse 14, talking about keeping the law? Again, Paul is saying here, we don't obey the law to receive justification We can obey the law because we've received justification. The commands like don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery, that's the negative way of just saying love your neighbor. Right? And that's what we're called to do is to love our neighbor. And so he's saying here that all sin in some sense is unloving to someone. In Christ, since we've been forgiven of our sins, we are now free to love as God has loved us. And so Christ fulfilled the law for us, and as he'll go on to say, by the Spirit, he fulfills the law in us so that we don't live according to the desires of the flesh, but we walk in step with the Spirit. And so verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed from one another. Paul says, don't use your freedom to exploit others. Don't turn into some animal that bites and gossips and tries to get one over on people and to make yourself good and with razor-sharp elbows to poke your way and to get ahead, Paul says, no, 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 no. Use your freedom for the good of others. Every single Christian possesses this powerful gift, this gospel freedom. And it's very easy to misuse it. Christianity has no dress code like Islam. You know, there's no... There's no specific dress code. But immodesty is often a way of loving yourself and not loving your neighbor. It's, it's we got to think about it. I'm free to do what I want, but just because I'm free doesn't mean I should do what I want. I do what's for the building up of those around me. 1 Peter 2 says, Do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. See, true freedom is realizing that it's not about me and what I want. It's about using what Christ has given for the good of those around me. Every 4th of July, one of the things that I've tried to do recent years is I read the Declaration of Independence. Just a good habit to do. And So I read through it early this morning, and it struck me as I was reading it this morning, as I was making my way through the bottom at the very, you know, if you've read it before, there's all the grievances against the king of England, this, 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 this. And with the very bottom, the very last paragraph, it says, therefore, something along, I'm paraphrasing, therefore, since we, these United States, are a free nation, independent of of the crown, so on and so forth. And they say at the very, very end, since we now have this independence, since we're declaring our independence, they said, quote, We mutually pledge to each other our lives and our fortunes and our honor. Boy, if the founding fathers can do that, cannot we in Christ? 
Knowing that we truly are free in Jesus, that we pledge our lives, that we pledge our freedom for the good of those near us. You remember David Potch and I mentioned at the beginning? The cops did show up, and they arrested him. And they took him to jail, and he eventually appeared before a judge. And the judge had heard the story, and he said, tell me what happened. And Mr. Potchin told him the story. And the judge could have thrown him in prison again. The judge could have thrown the law, the book at him. But the judge said, Mr. Potchin, you're a free man. What you need to do is learn how to live like a free man. My friends, in Christ, we are free men and women. What we have to do is learn to live like free men and women. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we thank you so much that the gospel liberates and rehabilitates. And Father, I know that, that every one of us in this room have moments and issues where we shackle ourselves, Lord, needlessly to guilt and shame. And so, oh Lord, we pray this morning for freedom. We pray for our consciences to be cleaned even as we confess our sins to you. We pray for our hearts to be free of shame and guilt, knowing that the blood of Christ cleanses from all our sins. Lord, free us from the pressure to perform because our acceptance is not in what we do. Our acceptance is in Christ and we pray that you will help us as your people to be on our guard against those who would lead us and teach us otherwise. And Father, for anyone that doesn't know Christ as Savior, who doesn't have this freedom, may today be their day of independence. Freedom from sin by repenting of their sins and trusting in Christ as their Lord and Savior. Help us, O Lord, we pray, now to walk in our freedom in Christ. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.